So thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk. Uh, this is uh, the slide that's about me. But this is the uh, talk. I'm giving a talk about, uh, about designing soldiers in XCOM, uh, Enemy Unknown and Enemy Within. So I'm Ananda Gupta. I'm a senior game designer at Fraxis. Uh, that's my corporate title. Uh, my, title uh, my project title is lead designer of XCOM Enemy Within. Um, I've been at Fraxis for just over three years now. I started in July 2011. Before that, I was at ZeniMax Online, working on the Elder Scrolls Online, uh, and before that, other places. Um, when I started at Fraxis, uh, XCOM Enemy Unknown was, so XCOM Enemy Unknown came out in October of 2012. So uh, it, was, it was already, there was a lot there already when I got there in, uh, in the previous summer. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do, well, when I arrived, the publisher had just come uh, for a visit, and it had gone very positively, but they had a couple of, int of interesting feedback points. And this was literally the week that I arrived in the office. Uh, and one of them was that soldiers don't feel quite compelling enough. People aren't feeling very attached to them when they play. Uh, you feel much more attached to the plasma rifle that your so soldier has rather than the soldier herself. That was understandable because in the 1993 game, which we were remaking, that was kind of how it worked. Uh, the soldiers were a lot less important than the items that they had. Um, you know, you would bring these huge groups, these 20, you know, 20, late in the game you'd have 20 soldiers on the Sky Ranger or on the advanced craft that you'd built uh, if you'd kind of left the Sky Ranger in the dust. And uh, you, you cared a lot more about their blaster bombs and their, and their gear than you cared about them. They were, they were, sort, of, they were sort of interchangeable um, for a lot of different reasons. And that was something that, and so I, and that was, in, in general, that was our approach on EU, was how did the 1993 game do it? Is that something that we want to adapt? Is that something we want to put our stamp on? Um, and if not, but, but in general, we want to try to preserve as much of the spirit of the 1993 game as possible. And, but soldiers were something where we wanted to do something different uh, because it wasn't quite feeling right like it did then. And so we, we, we were a little worried about what 93 fans, our, core, our sort of core fans, would think about that. But ultimately, we decided to... To, to, we, we needed to change soldiers. And so um, when I sat down with Jake uh, and he, you know, he, he, he and I were discussing this feedback, I said, well, I just spent the last four years working on MMO, so um, I'm probably not going to surprise you when I say we should do classes. <laughs> 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 and, um, and he, you know, he, he took that in stride. Um, and so with classes, why classes? Well, there are, a lot of different, there are a lot of different ways you can get character interestingness in classes. Uh, sorry, in games, right? Classes is just one of them. We didn't have to do classes. We could have done something else. Um, so in the 93 game, your soldiers got better on a sort of use-based system, right? If you had somebody throw things a lot, then that person would get better at throwing things. If they shot a lot, they'd get better at shooting. Um, uh, if they got shot a lot, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> if they got shot a lot, they died. Um, and uh, that was, and, and so use space systems are, and, and use space systems are still very popular today, right? You know, you don't pick a class, you just, you just kind of do what you want to be good at, and then you'll get better at that, and that's what you're good at, that's what you specialize in. The problem with use space systems, to me, and the reason I don't, the reason I, I, I kind of shied away from using something like that in, in, in this, is that they have great unfun potential. Uh, it's the classic oblivion problem of sticking the quarter on your space bar and going out to lunch and coming back to be really good at jumping, right? Because you just sort of face your character right at a hill, you stick the quarter on the space bar, you leave, and then your character jumps about 2,000 times when, you've, when you're away from the keyboard, and now you're really good at jumping. So that's a really optimal way to play, but it's not very fun. And one of the rules we have at Fraxis, and, and, and you know, this is not just ours, but it's a good game design rule, is the optimal way can't be, uh, can't, can't be not fun, <laughs> right? It's, if your game is fun, but only if you play it in a non-optimal way, that's not good. Because, because especially, I, th I take that especially harder for Axis, because our, you know, our games are strategy games, which we want people to figure out optimal ways of playing, right? I mean, let's face it, unless you're playing sort of hardcore multiplayer Call of Duty, those people optimize playing shooters. But most people who are playing shooters in the sort of single player way, they're, they're not optimizing how they play, but they're still having a lot of fun. So it's a, little, it's a little easier for them. But for us, you know, if you're playing Civ and you're having a lot of fun, but, you're, you, you know, but the AI is beating the tar out of you, then that's, that's not, you know, 
eventually you're going to say, well, I, I kind of want to win at some point. <laughs> and, and, then, and then if you, if you, do, if you don't win, if the only way for you to win is to do things that aren't fun, then you're not going to play very much anymore. So that, that, that's uh, use-based systems. We, we, we decided pretty quickly that we didn't want to do use-based systems. Another reason not to do use-based systems is they're awfully fiddly to track. And I don't mean for us. I mean, we can, you know, we can design UIs to do whatever we want and show all the numbers we want. But ultimately, um, we thought that classes were a much clearer and more and better way to message, okay, this soldier just became a sniper. Well, 90% of players will look at that and say, okay, got it. <laughs> right. You know, this soldier just became uh, a heavy. And, you know, visually they've got this rocket launcher and, and a big LMG. And okay, I know what that one's all about, right? And so, um, uh, you know, it's not coincidence that I picked the heavy. It was really obvious. Um, and then... So another, another problem we faced with classes was, and this turned out not to be much of a problem, but it was something we were thinking might be a problem, which was the maps. So obviously XCOM was well into production by then. You know, we'd really finished up a lot of maps. The maps were kind of not in a state where we wanted to change them a lot. And the level designers, who were a very conscientious uh, group, were saying, okay, do we need to change all the maps to fit the classes? You know, do we need to put in special class gameplay on the maps? Do we need to put like sniper nests and stuff? And I said, no, no, don't do that for one reason. Uh, you know, the producers will kill me if I tell you yes. And for, and for another, and, and for another um, it's, it's up to, you know, at, at this stage in the project, it's, it's kind of up to me and Jake to design the stuff, the classes, so that they fit what you've already done <laughs> and not the other way around. Um, and that's kind of, that, that, that can just, that, that's just something that happens organically in projects, right? Sometimes when two things kind of work together but they can't be done at the same time for whatever reason, you... You just have to make a call as to which one is going to drive the other. And in this case, we looked at the maps and we were like, okay, well, these are the abilities that we want to have based on the maps that we have. We're not going to tell you guys to overhaul the maps because, oh my God, awesome shiny new feature that we're doing in July 2011. So uh, other tricky bits about classes in XCOM. Uh, XCOM has permadeath. So that person that you, that, that you, whose abilities you spent a, a while picking is, is now dead and is never coming back. Unless you reload, but no, nobody here does that, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Iron Man. That's why. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Iron Man's so funny. We we thought Iron Man, we thought Iron Man was going to be something that five percent of the players used. We thought we're putting this in. It's kind of a little bit vanity. Most people are never going to use this. Everybody uses it. Everybody uses it. It's just one of those things where you're where 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 as a developer you're sitting there and it's like, this is kind of cool, but who's really going to play this? Oh, you know. Our most hardcore fans, they'll really love it, but everyone, and, and, then, and then it's completely the opposite. You know, sometimes there are things in your game that you just have no idea. This is another example. So uh, the aesthetic side of, of, of soldiers customization, this is something where I'm very unsentimental, right? I, I will use, I will customize soldiers very rarely. I, 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 when I play RPGs, you know, I'm playing Divinity Original Sin right now, and um, you know, when I play RPGs, my wife always customizes all the characters for me because I don't care, right? I, it's like, <laughs> she, you know, I tell her, I, I tell her, you know, uh, you know, she, 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 she is, she is, she, she all, all my characters look like what she wants them to look like. <laughs> and, and, and so I, and so when we were looking at customization, I'm like, really, you know, are we really doing this? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't do this in the 93 game very much, you know? <laughs> and I was like, really? I don't know. And then, and, and, but, but Jake, Jake was absolutely adamant that, you know, customization is really important. I'm like, okay, I mean, I get that it's important, but, but I mean, we're doing a lot of it, you know, given that we have permadeath. And, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was totally wrong about that. <laughs> I was totally wrong about that. Everybody loves customization. Uh, and I kind of do it now, too. So, um, so uh, with, 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 uh, w with, class, with class design in XCOM, the, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that we didn't torpedo work that we had already done uh, when we decided to make this move. And another thing that guided our class design heavily was the idea of buyer's remorse. This is something that I hate in games. I hate buyer's remorse. This is where you are level one and you have one skill point. So you spend your skill point on something cool. And then you level to two and you get another skill point. I'm playing Divinity Original Sin, did I mention this? <laughs> you get another skill point and you're like, oh, okay, I can, sp I can get another cool skill. This is great. And then at level three, you get another skill point and you say, oh, I, I want to get level two in this other one. Oh, that costs two skill points. You shouldn't have spent that one at level two. And now I'm sad. So, so that's, that's one kind of buyer's remorse. Um, where basically, where basically you are providing a sort of covert incentive to the player to save their skill points, and I, I hate that for so many reasons. One is that one is that you are now 
th this gets back to optimal and fun, right? It's fun when you level up to get a new skill, right? So why would you punish that? You shouldn't. Um, and I, I'm really enjoying Divinity, by the way, but that is something that sticks, that, that sticks at me. Um, and another, another is the idea that later skills, um, later skills are not, are, are worse when given your, your, worse or better given your previous skill build. And this is a trap because you obviously want to reward people for being clever in their skill builds, right? You want, you want people to feel smart when they've come up with a neat skill build. But you also, the, the, the problem is that you also don't want to have anticlimaxes. So the heavy is a good example here where um, there's an ability called Danger Zone. And Danger Zone is the one that, increased, that gives you bonus damage on suppression and increases the AoE of all of your attacks. Why is it like that? Well, it's like that because... Uh, if, you took, if, you, if you didn't take suppression, I, you know, I looked at it and was like, if you didn't take suppression, this ability is useless. You have to take the other one, right? So, um, so that's no good. And, if, and so we added the AOE boost onto it, the area of effect ability boost onto it, because the, the, the heavy always has that, right? Always has access to that. Um, and so that skill is always good, no matter what, but it's just better if you took suppression. So um, that's another kind of buyer's remorse that we wanted to avoid. Um, and then also uh, having, you know, with permadeath and with lots of soldiers, you know, most, most games that have classes and skill builds and stuff, you typically only have a few characters and they can't really die. Um, having, sol having lots of soldiers who can then die really quickly uh, and, and unexpectedly <laughs> en masse, um, uh, that, that meant that our, our skill system had to be really simple. And so that's why we came up with that skill tree there. A game that I took a lot of inspiration from uh, enough inspiration that I'm not even going to show you a screenshot of it because then you guys will think I'm a terrible plagiarist, is Battleheart, which everybody is an iPad game that everybody in this room should, should play because it's an incredibly cool game. And they're, they have, they're, they're, they're a sort of party-based RPG where you kind of you tap a character and you draw a line, and you know, when you draw a line, that's where they go. But if you draw a line to an enemy, then they attack. If you draw a line to an ally, then they heal. It's really neat. Um, and they have this incredibly cool little class tree system where all the skills are always good, no matter what you did. But in their game, you can respec freely because you can just change. Whereas here, respec is a waste of time because all your soldiers can die. <laughs> <laughs> and, or, and moreover, you have this endless, you know, you, you, as long as you can pay for them, you can recruit as many soldiers as you want. So if you don't like your sniper build, then just get somebody else. All right, so um, here are some ideas we didn't do. Um, I've actually talked a little bit about stuff we haven't done already, but um, one of the things that we didn't do was prestige classes. And this is something that I've always wanted to do in a game, but I've never had a chance. Uh, and I still haven't, um, <laughs> because and so the idea of a prestige class is, is is a little bit like Final Fantasy, where your your white mage becomes the white wizard, or is it the other way around? Your rogue becomes the ninja. That that I'm pretty sure is the right, right way around. And um, so you you have a class that becomes a better version of that class. Uh, Gauntlet does this too. The new Gauntlet, the not quite new Gauntlet, does this. This um, you know where your warrior once your warrior hits ten, you can morph into a minotaur, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I love that stuff because it's a really cool way of totally scrambling things once, the, once, once you're a little further in. And so what you can see here, this is a concept of a flame trooper, which was going to be the prestige class for the assault. So, so the, assault, uh, the assault, once you, once you unlock, we, the idea was we were going to give you a mission that let you unlock each. You were, we were going to make four missions, one, one for each class, and then you could unlock, uh, you could unlock the... Uh, uh, the prestige version, and then so if you did the, the assault one, then you could you could have your assaults optionally become flame troopers, um, and so that was that was neat. But uh, but ultimately, prestige classes had some issues. Uh, you know, we thought about them for Operation Slingshot, but had to you know we we, we kind of felt like that was a big that that, that was that was risky. Um, and then the other problem with prestige classes, as we had them designed, was that. You have to unlock them with a special mission, which would have been kind of the same every time you play. And in general, we want to avoid things that are the same every time you play. People who, want, who like that can play other games. <laughs> but, but Civ is not the same every time you play. XCOM is not the same every time you play. So we really want to try to dial that kind of stuff back. We, we want, and, and, so, and so having these having these kind of hoops that you have to jump through uh, to get to this really cool prestige class was something that we we, we didn't want to do, and yet we also couldn't think of a really great way to give you the prestige class without something like that. So, um, so that was th that was that. But of course, flamethrowers are neat enough that they came back uh, in Enemy Within, as many of you no doubt know. 
uh, because we don't really kill ideas at Fraxis. We, we always keep them around and, uh, and see if we can use them again. So um, with ability design, uh, this is something where, so I, uh, one, of my, one of my things as a designer is I do, I do tend to overthink things. And um, one of the things that game designers do is they'll, they'll put a lot of thought and, and planning into things that, that players don't pick up on at all. <laughs> and so for example, I was absolutely adamant that at major, every class has to have a sort of class-specific survivability type of passive ability. This had to be case, had to be true, right? Once you get to major, you don't want your soldiers to die anymore, so we need to give you an ability that helps you let, make them not die. Um, and you know, it's important enough that we don't give you a choice, right? Don't give you a choice in major. <laughs> um, I thought that, I thought that like, if we didn't do this, this was just all, this was all gonna go up in flames. Of course that's not true, right? People, people would have done fine. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's, it's something where, it's something where this, this sort of ironclad design principle that you come up with when you're doing a system is something that players don't care about at all. Another thing, and this was, this was interesting from EU to EW. Um, so in EU, we had a big concern about wipe recovery, right? What happens if the player it only has four soldiers that they've ranked up and wipes uh, after the alien base? You're pretty screwed, right? You would be pretty screwed. So it was important to design the XP curve for soldiers so that you could start out from rookie, even at that point, and kind of get to almost max soldiers by the end. And we, we did this in a few ways, like we gave you bonuses if you had low ranking soldiers against fairly scary aliens uh, in terms of XP and leveling. And um, yeah, that turned out not to be such an issue because people uh, people in Iron Man would lose spirit and, 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 and give up. <laughs> and people who weren't playing Iron Man would reload, and that was that. So we didn't really need to worry about wipe recovery quite so much as we did, but we worried about it. And then, um, so in EW, we made the, X, uh, the XP curve pretty uh, noticeably steeper, and uh, that, that was just part of the part, of getting it closer to where it was originally thought to be. Uh, I've already talked about no respec, but um, uh, respec, aside from being a pain, you know, it's a pain for the player, it's a pain for us. You really only want respect if it's really adding a lot of value to the player, and you know. So in a game, in a game, in, in MMOs like World of Warcraft or whatever, obviously you have to have respect, uh, but but here you don't, and 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 we 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 threw that out pretty quickly. Another thing that I had this huge principle about was that you can't make players pick between active and passive abilities at any given rank. So, and and that's because buttons are fun, right? If I tell you here are two cool abilities, but one of them gives you a button to press and one of them doesn't, um, then I, I felt players will always pick the button. And I'm not sure if that's true, but I, th I think that's a pretty good principle. Um, but we, we definitely, you know, I, I certainly pounded the table more about that than probably had to. Um, <laughs> um, we did, however, you know, we do give you one ability at, pa at Squatty, which is class defining, and then uh, we do only let you pick between buttons, you know, and, and we want we, you know, we want to make sure everybody gets a button at roughly the same time, you know, so that people don't people don't say, oh, the heavy the heavy got a uh, uh, you know got a button at uh, lieutenant and the sniper got a button at sergeant. Clearly, heavies are not as good, except that in fact we ended up making it so that heavies got a button earlier than everyone else. So go you know go figure. But this this was this was MMO fatigue for me, right? I again I spent four years working on an MMO, so I was so I was so immersed in this idea that the classes are all going to hate each other, right? <laughs> right, that, that the, people, the people who play different classes, you know, so the imaginary heavy is going to, you know, post on the forum and say, why do you hate my class compared to the sniper? I was so, I was, but it didn't even occur to me that in this game, you're all the same <laughs> person, so, so you're not going to care if the heavy gets a button earlier. And this, <laughs> this is one of those things that, that you just don't kind of realize that you're doing until it's done. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> right, I was, I was genuinely afraid that, that like people would say assaults are so much better than snipers and you hate us, you, why do you hate snipers? And people don't do that in a game where you get to be all of them. <laughs> but that was a good example, right? That, that was a good example where I sort of pounded the table and Jake said, no, no, we need suppression to be in the game earlier. Suppression's more of a core concept than, uh, than you are, uh, th than, than, the fact, we want to introduce suppression earlier and that's more important than your stupid rule. And, and I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but we did give it at lieutenant at, on the support, so that was, that was sort of how I rationalized. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a little bit about Enemy Within. So this, this was interesting. Um, 
so I had a huge amount of trouble uh, conveying what I wanted from the mech trooper in, in Enemy Within. Um, and I developed this incredibly hideous Visio spreadsheet or Visio diagram uh, that I have not put on a slide because uh, I would be embarrassed. Um, and I sort of handed it to the artists. So they are, you know, first of all, I write a doc. This is great. Like I wrote a doc, right, with words. And I handed it to the artist, and the artist like, I went, right, okay. So then I said, okay, great. You guys are visual. I need to make a diagram. So I put boxes, you know, and little connectors and stuff. And they were like, yeah. The where goes what, you know. And so, um, and so finally, um, I was, and, and our, the art director on Enemy Within, David Black, uh, was uh, very understanding. He's very tolerant of this. <laughs> and he, he, he paid, you know, he, I sat in his office and explained to him, you know, and walked him through the whole thing. And he said, I'm going to draw something that actually makes sense. And this is what he did. And it was, um, and then this is what we show the artists. And the artist's like, okay, got it. <laughs> right? Because um, artists understand pictures. That's, that's why they're artists. But this was, this was actually something I was really happy with because the Mech Trooper design had a lot of input from the team. It wasn't just me uh, dreaming up things, um, which is, that's dangerous. Um, so uh, one of our level designers, Orion Bircham, who I think is here somewhere. Uh, I don't know if he's in this room, but he's around here somewhere. And John Stewart, who's one of our tech artists, riggers, animators, he does everything. Uh, they came to me with this really cool idea where they sort of identify the roles that all the other classes have. This was one of the problems, this is always one of the problems with adding a new class in an expansion, is that presumably you designed the first game so that all the classes kind of filled up the tactical space, right? They all have defined roles that do stuff and you, you don't feel like there's a big hole because then the original game is not complete. So then now you say, okay, we're gonna add a new class. Well, what does a new class do? Uh, and so they came up with this cool idea of the mech trooper being an environmental uh, an area control specialist, because there wasn't really anyone in the, in the base game who was sort of devoted to that. And they had, they had this idea of tools where you could, you could sort of research and unlock different tools to attach to the suit, and it would do different things. Um, and, I had, and so I, I, I incorporated some of their ideas into what the mech troop ultimately became, which was the idea that you had an upgradable armor, right? We, none of the armors in the, in the original game in EU were upgradable. Excuse me, they all can't, you know, you just research carapace, okay, it just gives you health. You research skeleton, okay, it's like carapace gives you more health, but also gives you a grappling hook. Uh, but you couldn't, like, once you had a skeleton suit, you couldn't do anything to it. There were a couple of foundry projects that affected weapons a little bit, but we didn't really do a lot of that with armor. So we decided we're going to do that with Mech Trooper. We're going to make the armor upgradable, uh, and the soldier is going to rank up independently of that. So you could have a really advanced Mech Trooper. Uh, you know, at colonel rank with all the, all the training, but her suit could be Mark I, right? Or vice versa. Um, and so I, I think that was a really fun experience to, to work with, uh, you know, to, to get a lot of ideas. Because when, when, you, when you tell the team you're adding a new class, that's, that's pretty exciting, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people come up with, grit, with, with good ideas to help you. But nonetheless, it led to complexity, and so expressing this complexity to the artists was, was uh, something that we needed to do, and uh, I think with, with Dave and Dave's help and with uh, Chris Sulzbach, who you may have, I think he gave a talk previously or he might be giving one later. Um, I'm not sure, but anyway, he's our, he's our lead character artist and he, he and Dave uh, knocked, knocked these guys out of the park, it was great. A few other things we decided about classes. We, you know, we don't show you an XP bar on any of your soldiers because who cares. Uh, we, we tell you when a soldier's ranked up in, in missions um, because that's kind of a neat moment, but you, it also makes you want to make sure that person lives. Um, and the other thing, oh yeah, that's, th th this is another art point, which was, which was really cool. So coming in in July 2011 and saying we're going to do classes meant that um, the classes have to look different. So the heavy's got this sort of bomb suit uh, look, you know, with the sort of reinforced plates and padding and stuff. And this was something the artists had already made, right? They, they had been, they too had been grappling with the problem of differentiating soldiers. And they were lacking in context, right? Because again, the way, you know, previous, you know, previous, prior to the classes, all the soldiers, they kind of worked, they were, they were differentiated based on their weapons and their gear. And so the artists had come up with these really cool armor kits that you could sort of mix and match and put on. And they weren't sure what to do with them, right? Um, you may remember, so I don't have a picture, but um, like the sniper has those binocular things, and the uh, you know the, the assault has the red shotgun shell uh, epaulette type stuff. The artists came up with these kits that they were thinking we might want, 
and could be thrown into the customization system if we didn't think of anything. But when I said we want to do classes, you know, Greg Furch, our art director, his eyes lit up. He's like, oh, we can use these kits to indicate classes. And this is a great example of, um, of how some initi- you know, a lot of initiative and creativity by the artists really made the, the visual problem of classes a lot easier. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess one other thing about classes. This was something, the, the other thing um, that got classes really sold for uh, a number of the team was when I said that we were going to restrict rocket launchers to heavies. And the, the graphics and performance team looked at me you know, very, very gratefully. <laughs> when I, when, you know, because, because, of course, before classes, every soldier could have a rocket launcher. And how many rockets you could fire was dependent on your inventory. So you could blow up the whole map. And you could have literally the entire map on fire. And this was killing our performance. And it was killing our, it was killing, uh, yeah, it was terrible. Um, now you can still, I mean, you can still kind of blow up the map, but it's a lot harder, right? It becomes much more of an edge case. Um, and so, in other words, if, if a player becomes, if a, if, a, if a player comes into a map with four heavies, all of whom are colonels with the rocketeer, you know, so they have the extra rocket, you're kind of signing yourself up for the performance problem, <laughs> right? Whereas, whereas before you could kind of, you could kind of stumble into it and have a bad experience, you know? This is one of those things where, where we say, okay, there, there's a certain point at which the player kind of understands what they're signing up for. <laughs> so, um, so that was that was the the art and the uh, the, the art the art kit and and, um, and and the ability to sort of channel how much uh, how, how many very splashy abilities that cause the graphics programmers to have nightmares uh, go you know go in uh, was uh, was was another advantage of classes and I thought uh, uh, I thought it worked out pretty well. So um, that's all I have. Uh, I hope this was a fun talk uh, and not too, uh, uh, not too esoteric about, uh, about all sorts of game design stuff. But um, you know, remember what I just said about players who sign themselves up for stuff? You guys came to Firaxicon. <laughs> so, so this is kind of what you were signing up for. There's lots of, lots of geeky game design stuff. So <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'll be around. Uh, I'm going to be around uh, for the rest, and I'm going to be at, at, a, at a dinner table. So if any of you are at my table, I look forward to seeing you again. And um, uh, I will also be playing board games probably fairly late. <laughs> fairly. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>